work that Jesus did was well done. The work that Jesus did was a final work. There's nothing to be added. There's nothing to be subtracted. There's no amelioration of the work of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's why we can gather together on a day like this. And generations before us have. And until Jesus comes, generations will continue because his power is never faded. His grace never removed. The mercy we have is the same mercy they received and the mercy others will receive. Amen? Because Jesus made the decision to go to the cross on our behalf that we may live. Hallelujah. 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 We bless you, Lord God, for your grace and your favor. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the journey that you took. A long journey, a bumpy journey, an uncertain journey, but you did it that we might have everlasting life, that we may be called sons and daughters of the Most High God, that all creation may be brought back to the glory that it was in the beginning. And so today, Father, we honor you. We thank you for the word that will come out today. We thank you for your spirit that will guide the, the, the words. Your spirit will cause our hearts to be tender and our ears to be open and to receive of your goodness. And so, Father, bless this word to our hearts, to our spirits, to our minds, and transform us that we may give you glory in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. This morning is a little bit unusual because we are not going to focus so much on the cross as we knew it. And I will speak more about that. We are going to talk about that journey that he took. Because if he didn't take the journey, the cross would not have occurred. Amen. We talk a lot about purpose and we talk about will of God. And some of us believe that you can go to a retreat and fast for the weekend and know the complete purposes of God for your life. I tell you, it will not happen because the purpose of God is worked out in your life as you journey along the way. And so we must be determined to walk the walk of faith. And along that path, there are milestones. And I think perhaps we have different perspectives of what a milestone is. In a real road works terminology, a milestone was a piece of rock, a piece of concrete that said to you, you have come this far, you are here now, and the next destination is that one. And we use the same terminology in project management when we talk about planning for a date when there's something specific that's going to happen. We call it a milestone. And when something significant happens in your life, you get married, your child takes the first step, or the first mama, or you graduate, or whatever the situation, you come out of a, a, a sickness that was prolonged, you have a milestone, something to remember that you were there, you were here for a time, and now you're going there. And that is the thing about the milestone that we will speak about. You know, the word sort of came a little bit out of an experience we had. My daughter's birthday was this year, and she had this very strange and crazy idea that she wanted to go to Negril to have her birthday. And I'm like, Negril, the other side of the island, could we just kind of like go to KFC or, you know, do something simpler? But she said no, she wanted to go to Negril and she knew where she wanted to go and she had pictures of the place and you know as a good father you have to kind of try to see what you can do about it. But I I'm telling you that um, maybe I wasn't too thrilled at the beginning because I'm thinking of the cost, I'm thinking of the three and a half or four hour drive, I'm saying where are we going to stay? Four and a half. Thank you sir, I don't feel too bad then, I thought I was the slowest driver in the house. And we said alright. She went and prayed about it. I went and prayed about it. 
And I found a, a little piece in my spirit, and I said, all right, let's begin to build it out. And after that piece, I found that a lot of things started to fall into place. Our accommodation, the eating place, um, the date where we could go, everything started to work in our favor. And so we then launched out on the road. We launched out on the familiar roads, because, I mean, I've already been to Negril, but I don't remember exactly how to get past West Milan, right? And the specific place you want to go, I have no idea where that is, never heard of it. But anyway, so we started out on the familiar journey. I did Kingston, and we're talking, and everybody happy, and we're laughing, and we're you know, on our way to St. Elizabeth, and so on. But I noticed she started to do some strange things. She started to take pictures. So she'd get to a signpost, welcome to Clarendon. You have to turn, come off the road, and she'd take her pictures. You know, welcome to St. Elizabeth, and we have to pull off again. And, she said, and I'm saying, what, what's this about? And she said, boy, Dad, I, 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 I want to have some memories. You know, and I want to know where I'm going, and I want to know when I get back. I said, all right, so as father, again, you know, you have to um, follow the instructions of the boss. <clears throat> But you know, the funny thing is, we were fine for the full journey that I remembered. But when we got past Scotts Cove into West Milan, started to get a little iffy now. And the funny thing is that we actually got lost close to the journey. Almost right upon our destination, that's when we got lost. I'm telling you something that's significant, so don't forget it, all right? So she had never been to Negril, but she had three things in her favor. And I want you to look at it in a spiritual context. The first thing is that she had trusted and experienced guides, her parents, who had been somewhere on the journey before. Amen? And when you start your journey, you want to start your journey oftentimes in a place where you're familiar, where you kind of get a little glimpse. Um, Psalm 119 says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I've listened to some translations that says your words are beam to my path. That's not what the scripture says. Because what they had was a little lamp that every step you took, you could see that point and you could see just a little bit beyond. And so it is that if you're going on a journey that you don't know, get someone who is experienced already on the journey. For us in the spirit realm, that's the Holy Spirit who knows the way before. The second thing was we had a mental roadmap. And in this case, spiritually, the mental roadmap is like the Word of God. Because the Word of God gives you the broad principles. It tells you that you leave in Kingston and you've gotten to St. Catherine, you've gotten to Clarendon, and you know into St. Elizabeth and so on. And it keeps you on track generally in the right direction. But at some point in time, you're going to need precision. You're going to need detailed instructions for where you're going and what that purpose is. And I consider that like your spiritual GPS. Because your spiritual GPS continues to recalibrate. Every time you turn, it recalibrates. And every time you get on a road, it recalibrates and it tells you exactly where to go. I looked at Matthew 16, and I saw the same kind of thing between here in the generality and the specificity. So um, Matthew 16, Paul was on his way through um, Phrygia in the region of Galatia. And the word said, and the Holy Spirit forbade them to preach in Asia. Now, why didn't the Spirit just tell him straight up, just, you know, go to Macedonia? No. The Spirit got him to a point, And then they moved on to Mysia. And then they moved on to Bithia. But all the time the Spirit keeps saying, don't preach in Asia. Don't go to the next place you think. And sometimes that's like the roadmap that God gives us. He might tell you to launch out in a business. But the details you have to walk through on the journey. He might tell you that person that you see is going to be your husband. But the man don't talk to you yet. Maybe the first time he come to church. They don't go up to him and say, hi, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm going to be your new no, that is not so right. Okay, so don't do that. I know some I have brethren who have done that. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
But it wasn't until they got to Troas that the Holy Spirit gave him a dream. And the dream was specific. It was about someone from Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. That's like your GPS. The GPS hones in on the details and take you through the details. Amen? On this Good Friday, then you say, what's all that have to do with anything? So remember now that Christ, the eternal, who lived in glory, never walked the earth as a man. Flesh and blood, frail, needing food, needing support, needing companionship. On his way to the cross then, you can imagine, that's an unfamiliar journey. It's a place where he had never been. To do a work that he had never done before. To follow the Spirit in ways he never did. And so, here we go on our journey. The milestone, milestone number one. The road of preparation. The road of preparation is like a dual carriageway. You have some familiarity. You can move along fairly easily. I thought about my family trip, and we knew generally where we want to go, as I mentioned. And sometimes in our lives, it's like choosing a career. When I started, I said, you know, I want to do the sciences. Okay, that's broad. And I love um, botany so, and biology, so I said, I'll focus in that area. There's no way you could tell me that I would end up in energy at this stage of my life. But God got me in the right institution. Then he got me in the right company. Then he caused me to meet the right people. Then he opened my eyes to things that I didn't realize I loved. And then he took me into this place where I am. It's like marriage. You see someone, but you're not quite sure how it's going to go. And sometimes we buck at the altar because we don't think we can go much further because we're not quite sure where the road is going to go. But you must step out because that's the general start. And so Christ knew his destination, but he had never been there before, as I mentioned, as frail man. And so he needed the Holy Spirit to show him those mileposts, right? Those milestones so that he would move along. This is what he left heaven with, that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's what he left heaven with. And now he's in an unfamiliar context, walking the journey on earth. And as a 12-year-old, he expressed a better understanding. He says, I'm about my father's business. It's like Joshua um, Nixon speaking to the elders in the church and teaching them things that they had never understood before. He said, I'm about my father's business. But the foreknowledge that Jesus Christ had didn't make his journey easy. We agree? It didn't make his journey easy. And believe me, as God reveals to you, it doesn't necessarily mean your journey is going to be easy either. So for this journey, Jesus needed to be prepared. He needed an immersion in the Holy Spirit. He needed empowerment of the Holy Spirit. This was his consecration. Like any athlete or bodybuilder, they go through these phases. They go through boot camp. You can't live in boot camp. You just go in boot camp for a time. You change your diet. You change your water intake. You change the level of stress you put your body under. You train harder, but it's for one purpose, and that's for victory. Jesus had to bring his body, his mind, his spirit, his soul into subjection of the will of the Father in a different way than he ever had before to travel this full journey to the cross. Therefore, to bring his mind and his will into submission, he was baptized by cousin John. <laughs> Not because he had sins, but because he was totally committed to purity, totally committed to accepting that death was the way, and he gave himself over. And you can look at it in Matthew 3, where it talks about um, that baptism. And John said, no, 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 no. You should be baptizing me, not me, you. And Jesus said to him, permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. I think over the last two Sundays we have heard, let's not discard the law. Because Jesus himself fulfilled the law. Amen. 
And then we know that the work he did was not just for him, but it was also for us. Because now Romans 6, 3 to 4 and Colossians 2, 11 tells us that we were baptized into his death. So he was establishing the way that we are signaled, as it were, um, to others of who our allegiance is. It says we are buried through baptism, but it also speaks about us being raised up again through faith. So Jesus did that whole baptism thing, fulfilling the law, but also showing us how he would die, how he would be risen. Amen? And when he emerged, of course, the Holy Spirit came and alighted upon him in the form of a dove, signaling that God had approved him completely. That preparation was necessary because on the journey, he would need two things. He needed the general direction from the word as he walked about in his life. He also needed the specific directions from the Holy Spirit and the Spirit then being his spiritual GPS. Amen? But his preparation was not completed. He still had to bring the whole body into submission to the Holy Spirit who led him into the wilderness. Can you imagine you think that all of that drama and the Holy Spirit come upon you, you know, rush out into ministry, as many of us do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. He had to go into the wilderness to be tested and tried to learn to listen to the voice of the Spirit and to align it with the Word of God. And Satan came to test him in Matthew 4. Satan came to test his flesh and body with the thought of food and to tell him to satisfy your temporal needs. Don't worry about this long-term thing that you're thinking about. Just eat now, okay? You're hungry now, right? But Jesus said, no, I'm not going to put the eternal in behind the fleshly and the temporal. And then Satan said, all right, well, that's not working, so let me try something else. You, you know who you are already, you know, so why don't you just sort of jump off the cliff and call angels to come catch you? And Jesus said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to be presumptuous before God. And the third one, Satan then, the audacity of him to say, look here, man, just bow down to me, and I'm going to ensure that you have the worlds before you bowing down at your feet, worshiping you and all that. And Jesus, you know, just gave him a good telling off according to the word. No, 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 no. That's not going to happen. And so Jesus defeated Satan by standing firmly on the word. And as I remember, Sherman said, the Holy Spirit will not tell you to do something that's contrary to the word. So if you think you hear some wonderful prophecy, some awesome thing, and it does not align with the scripture, or if it contradicts the scripture directly, I suggest you stop and ask the Holy Spirit, did you just speak? But Jesus knew how to align that voice with the word. And so now Satan was defeated in that context. And the angels came and ministered to Jesus. And this road that he was on of the preparation was coming to a close. And the second milestone on the journey was now here. That journey to the cross. The road from fame to infamy. Slides. Milestone two. The road from fame to infamy. You know, like my family trip again, Jesus starts his journey in a familiar place. Galilee, Jerusalem, Judea. And we tend to do the same, as I mentioned. We look to the careers that we feel comfortable in. You know, if you're good with your hands, maybe you might want to go into engineering, you might want to go into the arts. If you're good at, you know, dancing, you want to go into some artistic um, expression. I mean, if you like dissecting frogs, you might say, boy, you're going into medicine or something. But you have to follow the Lord to know where he intends to take you. Not just jobs. Again, relationships, ministries, services, all these things, we look to the Lord. In Matthew 4, 23 to 25, <clears throat> The word said that Jesus went into the Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the kingdom, etc. And then it says in verse 24, then his fame 
went throughout all Syria. And further down in 25, it says, great multitudes followed him. So he's now on his road to fame, but it's going to end up in infamy. Infamy means that he becomes famous for what people think are illegal things, wrong things, bad things, things for which he should be removed for. But he starts out with fame, and the people start to come to him. They start to follow him everywhere he goes. And Jesus goes to the wedding in Galilee and turns water into top-shelf wine. I mean, can you imagine the crowds that would follow him? You know, every, every party that you have, you say, <clears throat> um, Jesus coming. If Jesus not coming, you know, I'm not so sure I can make it. I have an appointment on that day. He was famous. People knew him. The demons themselves started to call him out by name. And Jesus had to rebuke them because it wasn't time for people to know who he was. And then he did these signs and wonders and people, you know, gathered around him and he preached about the gospel and he taught them the laws and people were amazed at the signs and wonders. But the miracles, the signs and the wonders were also important, not, not just to create those who would come to see the kingdom, but to create enemies. You see, death on a cross was his destination. Always remember that. Your fans won't kill you. <laughs> Your enemies will. So his fans are not going to take him to the cross. Somewhere down the line, he has to generate energy, um, enemies, or enemies need to be generated. So when his gr fame grew with the people, his infamy also increased with the leaders because they became jealous. They became blinded. They became hateful. They became misled. And the milestone of fame and infamy had to mark his journey to the cross. But like a milepost or like a signpost, it helped him to tell him how near the cross was. And especially when his infamy and the hatred became greater than the affection. Then he knew he was really close. And so following Lazarus' resurrection in John 11, one of his most amazing signs and miracles up to that point in time, people were kind of fuzzing around him. But the word of God said, then from that day, they plotted to put him to death. Over the miracle, you know. Not because he did something wrong. Over a good thing that he did, they plotted to kill him. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country, into the wilderness, to a place called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. The chief priests, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, the councils, the leaders, they hated him because he was now taking away their fame. He was now taking away and threatening their authority. He was taking away... Um, the little sovereignty that remained in Israel. They felt that he was going to destroy the sacred temple. Temple. They felt he was messing up the way that the law was taught and how they could manipulate the law. Because remember Jesus said, these guys, they tell you what to do and lay heavy burdens on you, but they're not even going to lift a finger to help you. That's how they taught the law, not the way Jesus taught the law. And then finally, he refused to submit to them. I mean, that's a whole resume for people to hate you. And they most certainly did. But then, you know, it got a little bumpy on that journey, even more so because his closest circles started to divert. So Judas was the first one. He started to divert because he really didn't like the way Jesus handled money, right? The lady come with her nice alabaster box expensive and judas calculator started to run and he calculated the interest and he compounded the interest and he ran the numbers and he said yes we're good we can cover about 12 journeys and i can get my cut out of it and so on and john 12 tells us his heart but one of his disciples judas iscariot simon's son who would betray him said why is this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. And we'd say, well, maybe it's just good financial management. 
No. The scripture goes on. It says, This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to put his hand in it. That's why. But the last straw from his haters was Jesus' triumphant and prophetic entry into Jerusalem. That's, that's like the last straw. John 12, 12 to 13 tells us about that time. And the people shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. It's very significant. Because even if they had shouted the Hosanna, the, the prophets and the priests and the scribes would continue to say, he offends us as a religious leader. But no, they had the key in their hands. <laughs> King of Israel. Well, with this declaration, they were now motivated. They were inspired. They had their whole plot set out how to get rid of him. Before this, you know, in John 7, they said he was a madman. They said he had demons. They said he was teaching falsehood. They said he committed blasphemy, but they still couldn't touch him because his fame with the people as a miracle worker, his fame with the people as one who was an awesome prophet and an authoritative teacher kept him surrounded. And on this road from fame to infamy, now the declaration he's the king of Israel was that last pin that they needed. And so the last reinforcements of this milestone was set because they could get the Romans to kill him. <laughs> the Romans to kill him for treason. Because, of course, now this man is rising up as a king. He's a direct threat to Caesar, a threat to the entire Roman Empire. And they could keep their hands clean. You see, when the word of God says the man's heart is wicked from his youth, you can start from Adam and the last man until when Jesus comes. It remains true that they had wicked intentions, but to help themselves. Sometimes this might happen in your life. Because I'm telling you, it's happened in my life. It happened to me in the workplace, and it happened to me among friends. As the love for me grew, and as people saw what I did and felt it was good, so also insecurities grew. And envy, and jealousy, and hatred, and scheming, until there was a moment, and they found an opportunity to remove me out of the way. And it might happen to you. I hope it doesn't but it might happen to you. So be very clear, if Jesus went through it, you could go through it. And so what's the position of Jesus? In John 12, 27 to 28, he says this, and we read it this morning. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And so can you imagine on this bumpy road from fame to infamy, with this assurance from his father, he knew it was time to move on to the third milestone, the testing of his resolve his commitment to actually finishing the work for which he came. I thought of this road, this road to resolve. It's a little bit like a parochial road, you know, like, a, like a country road, not paved, but bumpy, and the stones coming up out of the rocks. Remind us a little bit of where we went, because as I drove, you know, and the car is bouncing up and down, and we're going over rocks, and it's a one lane, and there are you know, animals on the side, a mock a bush. And I'm saying to myself, did we book the right place? Did we just get scammed or something? What, I mean, what's going on? <laughs> um, Ruth and maybe we should, you know, check the phone again and see if we have the right address. The road on the road to resolve can sometimes be like that. Bumpy, treacherous, unpleasant. And when he's this close to the journey to the cross, Sometimes it's the hardest time. It's a time when the weight of the trials start to come. The weight of the barriers and the challenges that come are more than he experienced ever before. 
it forces you to ask yourself some questions. Did your vision line up with God's plan in the beginning? Is your sanity intact? Are you still ready to go forward to resolve the, to the finish? And that little scenario I gave you of my life, I remember one day, a pivotal day, a milestone day in my life, when the work had piled up and when all the plots were against me and I was being called up before different persons. And I got up from my desk and I said, enough. And I walked out. Funny enough, I walked down Ruth Venn Road and I prayed before the Lord and the tears flowed. And I said, Father, you and I were going forward. I turned back, cleaned up my face, walked into the office and I smiled and I did my job. And soon after that, God opened a door for me. I laid out my fleece to him and he opened the door. That door, I'll just tell you, I won't tell you. <laughs> The door was awesome. It led me into where I am now as an independent. And I'm happy as can be. Amen? But sometimes the road is like that. And you have to have your resolve tested. Are you serious about who you are? Are you serious about your walk? Are you serious about your faith? It's not all smooth paved roads. You have to be resolved. And in times like this, you get detailed guidance from the Holy Spirit. Or you will lose your way. At times like these, you need to hear from the Spirit. So it's time to engage with that GPS in your spirit, the Holy Spirit, who tells you at this pivotal moment, what next? So back into our family trip. <laughs> After traveling 145 kilometers, some three and a half hours from Kingston, you know, it's only in the last 10 or so minutes we get lost. I couldn't believe it. All the way out to Negril and get lost. We actually drove past where we should have turned. And of course, <clears throat> perhaps like so many, you know, you kind of keep cool until it really is hopeless. <laughs> and then you, you say, um, I think we're lost. <laughs> can you please pull out your GPS? Let's see if we can find our way back to where we're supposed to go. And sometimes it's like that in a walk, the spiritual walk, eh? In your own self-confidence, you know the path is very familiar. And you keep doing the things that you know you keep doing. But God may say, it's time for something new. And I'm taking you on a different path. And so I want you to listen to my spirit so that you know your way on this unfamiliar highway. So our family surrendered. We pulled out the Google map. We checked it. And we discovered that we had already passed the turn. <laughs> So we turned back, and with precision, Google Maps, the GPS just led us, turn right, four meters, turn left. And we're like, okay, left, right, left. I, I defied it one or two times, <clears throat> I confess, and I was wrong. So we went back to turn left, turn right. <laughs> Technology is amazing when it works. So when your journey on life, relationships, job, career, whatever it is, goes bumpy, goes unfamiliar, just quiet yourself down. Quiet yourself down. Go back to the general roadmap of the word. Go back to the familiar voice of a friend, the voice of the Holy Spirit, your spiritual GPS. But it's all about Jesus, right? That's who we're talking about. So on this penultimate lap, the disciples of Jesus finally passed a test. You would think, know that they know. And Jesus said, who do men say I am? And Simon Peter, after all the other guys, said, well, some people say you're prophets. And Jesus said, come on, guys, man, really? It's been three years. You don't know who I am? And Simon Peter stands up and says, well, <clears throat> you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus didn't give many kudos. He says, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. <laughs> this is just the Holy Spirit who will reveal it to you. And you would think that after that, everything would be great. Because now everybody got it, right? No. That's when the height of that crisis to test his resolve began. 
Because that same Peter, his star pupil, was influenced by the Satan, the other spirit. And, say, and, and so Peter called Jesus aside. He said, Jesus, Jesus, psst. I'm going to tell you something. I said, you know what? This thing you're talking about, death, no, that's not for you. Uh, you know, I, I rebuke you. Far be it from you that this should happen to you. And Jesus had to stand on his feet and say, no, I rebuke you, Satan, who has influenced Peter. You know, I rebuke you. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And then it so happened that the A team of the disciples, the inner circle, who Jesus prepared and he trained and he sent out and he promoted and he anointed, they started to fight among themselves. Can you imagine? You set up your team. This is your A team to go and conquer the world. And your team starts to say, who, which one of us is the greatest now? You know, I'm nice and tall. You don't think me? No, I guess, no, man, I'm bright. You know, I studied the law. You don't think me? Another one said, boy, I did medicine. You know, maybe I should. And he sees his team crumbling before him after all of this labor. It must have broken his heart. And then Judas, the financial controller, took a bribe. And you think that sellout is a modern day thing? Judas sell him out big time. You think scamming and chopping is a new thing? No, no, no. From that time, Judas <laughs> was into that business. And they gave him money. And the word said he sought to betray Jesus. And then Jesus goes to find solace and directions from his father. And the three guys who were close to him pass out and sleep while he needed them the most. Peter and the two sons of Zebedee abandoned him emotionally in his darkest time in Matthew 26. And if we think that that was not enough, that later on the team abandoned him physically. So this is a test of his resolve. Because there's nothing that would stop Jesus from saying, you know, I've had enough of this. I'm gone home. Because what are you going to do? Make him on God? I don't know. Anybody can guide me? Can you make God on God? No, so he could just pack it up and say, let's go home. And then he hangs out with the Holy Spirit and the Father and say, you know, I'm tired of these guys. Let's get rid of them and just burn them up. I'll just start again. That's what, you know, God has that authority. But he says, no, I'm going to stick with it because I committed, because I walked the path, and because I know the end result. And so, as with Jesus, so with us. The word is true. The Father never left him nor abandoned him in his most difficult times, and he's not going to do that with you. The Father comforted him and reminded him for his reason for this journey and the glorious outcome, and he will do the same for you in your journey, in your darkest time, in your greatest insecurities, when all have abandoned you, when you don't know if you have any close friends left, just find a quiet space, the secret place where you know the Father's voice, where you know what his word says, when the Holy Spirit can refresh you and strengthen you to finish the journey. This is the road that Jesus is on now. This is the milestone that he's going through, the test of his resolve. He came to know, as we know, people are weak and inconsistent. Don't get too upset. We all are like that. But God is reliable. God is unchangeable. God is sure. And God is strong. And Philippians 1, 6 reminds us, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Anything that God has given to you to do, he will complete it. But make sure that you know the roadmap. Read the word. And make sure you know the sound of the GPS, the voice of the Holy Spirit. So lift your head up now. Because now we come to the end of the road, that last milestone, 
the finish, the tetelestai. The tetelestai is like a narrow dirt track. Not many persons can move on it. Maybe it's just wide enough for you on a donkey. And it's not a lonely place. It's not a pleasant place. But it's part of the journey. We got back <clears throat> from our little family trip. We got to the destination, yes. What a wonderful time. I bless my daughter and I, I'm really proud of her. Just listening to the spirit and saying, this is what she wants. And, and causing us to stick with it. It was a wonderful time. And when we got back, I said, why did I even want, worry in the first place? Why, why didn't, shouldn't, shouldn't I know this should have worked out? It seemed to have been a clear path now that we were here looking back, but not when we started out. But it would not have been the same without that same mental roadmap or the GPS in the natural and in our lives, in a spiritual sense, you need the word that roadmap and you need need the elders have been pushing this pumping this repeating it we need the Holy Spirit that GPS in our lives to keep us on a journey and so on the last milestone of this journey we hear the echoes of the GPS the Holy Spirit you have now come to your final destination you know I say yes I am there. And you see the little red dot at the end of the, the blue line. And you say, it is finished. It is tetelestai. For Jesus, it was finished. And for you and for me, whatever God will take us through, at some point in our lives, we will be able to say, it is finished. It is completely done. There's nothing more to be added or subtracted. That's what tetelestai means. There's no amelioration of the work. There's no one to come to add to the work. There's no one who can subtract from the work. And there's no one that can improve on the work. It is completely finished. I start, end where I started. I know it's a little bit of a strange Good Friday message as we normally focus around the crucifixion and the, the death and the pain and the suffering and the betrayal. But this particular Good Friday, I believe the Lord would have us know. And to keep, not just for the remainder of Easter, but beyond that, and keep it simple, Jesus followed all the milestones on his journey to the cross, and it ended well. And it will be the same in our lives. If we follow the road map, if we follow the voice of the Holy Spirit, on that cruel milestone that lifted up Jesus, he arrived at his destination. And this is what the scripture said in John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop and put it in his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, a little bit like that last leg of the journey, he said, it is finished. If you want to know what Jesus finished, let's go back to the original plan. Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Just say to your neighbor, I am one of the many. I am one of the many. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given to me. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself and the glory which I had with you before the world began. So this is where we end. So Jesus Christ did the journey on the earth to glorify his Father, to give eternal life to us. Then he went back home to his former glory. I am blessed because he completed the journey. And today, this is the message for every one of us here, every one of us online. Whether you 
are nav navigating relationships or career, investments, transitions in life, I say this to you. Trust the word of God for his principles for living. Trust the heart of God to know his desires for you. Trust his Holy Spirit for the specific guidance you need. Father will get you to your destination and clothe you with his glory. Amen? Amen. 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 I don't know if there's anyone here who has not given their lives to the Lord. And I'm not sure if there's anybody online who has not given their lives to the Lord. But if you have not, you are missing out on a glorious ride to have the companionship of the Father God and the presence of his Holy Spirit for every turn in your life, you are missing out. Is there anyone here who has not given, surrendered their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the kingdom of God? Amen. Amen. Amen.